This is Dr. Muhammad Sharaf al-Din, Associate Professor of Ophthalmology in Asiat University, and I will discuss the OCT and OCTA changes in retinal vascular diseases. For time's sake, I will discuss these changes in diabetic retinopathy and vascular occlusion as the two commonest causes of these disorders. First, in diabetic retinopathy, I want to stress that the combination of fundus fluorescein angiogram and OCT as a baseline in diagnosis is very crucial in all cases of diabetic retinopathy. And the addition of the OCT angiography, it gives a little bit more information, especially for the capillary perfusions and in some selected cases where the fundus fluorescein angiography cannot be performed as in asthmatic or patients with renal failure. Microaneurysms are the hallmark of the pathology in diabetic retinopathy, and it appears in the B scan of the OCT as a ring shaped lesion with a hyperreflective border and a moderate reflective or low reflective material that cause shadowing of the underlying structures. These ring shaped lesions are located mainly at the inner nuclear layer, at the vicinity of the wall of the cyst, and in this case also. However, it may be large enough to be located at the retinal fiber layers, as we can see here, there is some exudations beside it. Cysts appear as a multiple low reflective spaces of variable sizes and variable shapes with thin stretched walls are located at the outer nuclear layer and very rarely in the inner and the ganglion cell layer. The cavity of these cysts are usually optically empty or optically clear, however in some cases it may harbor some moderate reflective or hyper reflective material that represents some exudation. Their walls are thin and stretched, and they represent uh, the stretched fibers of the Henle's layer, molar fibers, and bipolar cells. With time, as these cysts become chronic, the wall of these cysts becomes more thickened, appearance of large cysts at the center of the fovea, with loss of these vertical pillars due to atrophy of these vertical neuronal cells, and coalescence of these cavities together which carry a poor prognostic value. As an effect of treatment, these cysts regressed into a multiple smaller size cavities with a thick and irregular wall and a crooked aspect. Hard exudates appear as a hyperreflective material that deposited in the inner and the middle retina. However, in some cases, they are get deposited at the outer retina and this carry a poor prognostic value due to loss of the outer retinal cells. Retinal hemorrhages appears as a hyperreflective or moderate reflective material deposited in the inner retina. However, in this selected case, it involves the whole fovea, and we should return to the color photos for proper differentiation between hemorrhages and exudates. Hyperreflective foci may represent the subclinical features of lipoprotein extravasation that acts as a precursor of hard exudates, or may represent degenerated retinal cells or macrophages attempting to engulf the cells. Serous detachment represents loss of the outer retinal barrier and appears as a clear fluid accumulate in the subretinal space, as we can see in these cases. Drill sign or disorganization of retinal inner layer. In this condition, we cannot distinguish the inner retinal layer from each other. And it carry a poor prognostic value on visual acuity when it involves the central 1 mm region. Proper evaluation of the outer retinal layer, the external limiting membrane, ellipsoid zone, and retinal pigment epithelium is very important as a prognostic value in cases of diabetic macular edema. Discontinuation interruption of these layers have a poor prognostic value and consider one of the causes of a permanent visual loss in DME. One of the main functions of OCT is evaluation of the vitromacular interface in diabetic patients. We can differentiate between vitromacular adhesions and epiretinal membranes, and in this case, this is VMA or vitromacular adhesion caused by partial PVD that associated with sometimes splitting in the posterior cortex of the vitreous, causing vitreous cases. Epiretinal membranes appears as a hyperreflective layer that causes traction and distortion of the vitromacular interface, it may cause diffuse macular thickening and elevation of the fovea. These hyperreflective membranes may cause anteroposterior traction, causing distortion of the foveal architecture, and may cause splitting in the posterior vitreous cortex or vitreous cases.
These membranes may be thick enough, causing distortion of the whole vitromacular interface in the macula in long-standing PDR cases. According to OCT, we can classify different DME patterns into a sponge or diffuse thickening, a cystoid macular edema, serous detachment, or a combination between cysts and serous detachment. A more clinically relevant classification that combines pattern with ETDRS map used to classify diabetic macular edema into a center involved diabetic macular edema, whether it is a sponge, cystoid macular edema, or with serous detachment. And non center involved diabetic macular edema, which is a focal macular edema, which does not involve the center 1 mm of ETDRS map. As regards OCT angiography changes in diabetic retinopathy, microaneurysms appear as a cold structures or a fusiform or small dilated knob seen in the superficial capillary plexus and deep capillary plexuses, and unfortunately they are not well delineated compared to fluorescein angiogram. OCTA is claimed to depict only 50% of microaneurysms seen in fundus fluorescein angiogram, and most of these located at the deep capillary plexuses. One of the most important values of OCTA is evaluation of the extent of the capillary non-perfusion better than fundus fluorescein angiogram, which appears in OCTA as an area of low flow signals, widening of the vascular zone, and the telangiectatic changes seen at the edge of the vas. With this non-invasive imaging tool, we can accurately evaluate the ischemic changes in the foveal vascular zone and in this PDR patient. Where we can repeatedly perform OCTA safely and detect changes over one year of follow-ups, we can depict widening of the foveal vascular zone and increase in the areas of low flow together with the detection of the telangiectatic remodeling changes at the edges of the vas. Also, OCTA can well delineate rising new vascular tufts in new NVEs better than fluorescein angiogram, where leakage masks those lesions. Sometimes, color and fluorescein angiogram are equivocal and not conclusive about the source of leakage, as in this case. However, OCT angiography delineates well the hanging new vascular tuft from the edge of the disc. We can safely repeat OCTA scans for follow-up the PDR patients and detect the treatment response and the regression of the new vascularizations after injection of anti vgf or after panretinal photocoagulation. One of the main drawbacks of OCT angiography is the limited field of evaluation. However, with the evolution of this technology and the presence of a wide field OCTA image, about 12 by 12 scan, we can combine these images and evaluate the retina up to the med periphery. And as I said before, we can repeat the OCT image safely to follow up PDR patients. As I these patients, I fold him up for two years and detect the ischemic changes involving the temporal macula, the foveal vascular zone, and the involution of the new vascular tuft and replaced by a fibrous tractional membrane. And as regards retinal vascular occlusion, in retinal artery occlusion, there is retinal whitening caused by ischemic infarction of the affected part of the retina. In B scan of the OCT, there is hyperreflectivity of the inner layers compared to the outer retinal layer. And in some selected cases, we can detect the fibrin thrombus plaque within the cavity of the retinal vessel, as we can see here. This is a patient with central retinal artery occlusions with patent ciliaretinal artery. His B scan OCT shows discrepancy between the normal inner retina compared to the hyperreflectivity of the inner retina of the rest of the macula. This is another patient with central retinal artery occlusion with patent ciliaretinal artery, where we used the OMFAS OCT scan at the level of the inner retinal layer to give an excellent panoramic view for the pathology differentiating between the perfused area supplied by the patent ciliaretinal artery and the hyperreflectivity in the ischemic area which is supplied by the occluded central retinal artery.
Isolated ciliaretinal artery occlusion may be seen as a sequelae of central retinal vein occlusion as we can see in this patient. And it is actually a hemodynamic obstruction rather than a mechanical one, secondary to decreased perfusion within the ciliaretinal artery. B-scan and OMFAS OCT shows the same hyperflectivity of the inner retinal layer in the affected macular region. Grading for the OCT features in central retinal artery occlusion is offered by some authors, classifying it into incomplete central retinal artery occlusion so that shows hyperreflectivity of the inner retinal layer without retinal thickening, and we can easily differentiate between different layers of the inner retina from each other. Subtotal central retinal artery occlusion, where there is mild thickening of the retina with hyperreflectivity of the inner retinal layer, and we can differentiate those layers from each other's with difficulty. And total central retinal artery occlusion, where there is significant retinal thickening and hyperreflectivity of the inner retinal layer, and we cannot differentiate these layers from each other. OCT angiography in central retinal artery occlusion may carry some artifacts like motion artifacts due to improper fixation or projection artifacts in the deep capillary plexus due to significant hyperreflectivity of the inner retinal layer. This is a patient with occlusive vasculitis secondary to Bechet's disease that shows multiple arterial occlusion. Here the OCT angiography shows a big difference between the perfused and the non-perfused area. OCT and OCT angiography play an important role in diagnosis of cases of PAM or paracentral acute medial maculopathy, which may occur secondary to various retinal disorders like hypertension and vein occlusion, or it may be idiopathic as in this case. Where color and fundus fluorescein angiography are equivocal, B scan OCT shows characteristic hyperreflectivity of the middle retinal layer precisely at the junction between the inner nuclear and the outer plexiform layer. This hyperreflectivity may be segmental or diffuse. Omphasocity through this layer shows hyperreflectivity surrounding the occluded vessels. However, OCT angiography shows low flow signal or loss of the flow signal at the deep capillary plexus and loss of the characteristic appearance of this deep plexus. Another case of PAM in this hypertensive female where OCT angiography shows loss of the flow signals at the deep capillary plexus and loss of the characteristic pat pattern of this plexus, the OMFAS OCT shows hyperreflectivity around the occluded venule having characteristic fern-like appearance. P-scan OCT could be used at the time of the initial diagnosis in cases of central retinal or branch retinal vein occlusion and evaluate the macular edema both qualitatively and quantitatively, showing the presence of low reflective cysts with or without serous detachment. And we can safely repeat the OCT scan to follow up those patients and detect the improvement in the macular edema, disappearance of the cysts and retinal hemorrhage throughout the follow-up periods after multiple anti-VGF injections. B-scan OCT may be used as a good prognostic tool during treatment of macular edema secondary to vein occlusion. When we see interruption in the ellipsoid zone, loss of the vertical pillar, coalescence of this small cyst into a large central one, this may anticipate minimal visual improvements after treatment. Also, OCT angiography can show the extent of the ischemia involving the foveal vascular zone, both in the superficial and in the deep capillary plexus. It is also helpful in detection of complications that prevent visual improvement like vitromacular traction or lamellar macular hole. OCT angiography can solve the puzzle of diminution of vision even after improvement of the macular edema as in this patient with old hemispheric vein occlusion where it shows low flow signals and loss of the texture of the deep capillary plexus and also widening of the foveal avascular zone denoting extensive ischemia in this patient. Here is another patient with old hemispheric vein occlusion where there is loss of the ellipsoid zone in the B-scan OCT. The OCT angiography shows an extensive ischemia involving both superficial and deep capillary plexuses. Finally, this is an example of a female patient that came complaining from uh, acute vitreous floaters secondary to vitreous hemorrhage. 
Due to neglected old upper branch retinal vein occlusion, she refused to do fundus torosin angiogram. So we used the cross-sectional or B-scan OCT to diagnose the presence of new vascularization based as a hyperreflective material attached to the posterior hyaloid and wide field OCT angiography to detect the extent of ischemia involving the temporal macula, the new vascularization, and using the high-resolution 3x3 scans for detection, the uh, widening in the vovella vascular zone, and the remodeling changes with the development of collaterals in the deep capillary plexuses. And thank you for your attention.